when you run too fast, A, you're taking yourself out of that optimal aerobic development zone. Um, so you're kind of actually getting less bang for your buck than you would if you ran slower. And you're also increasing the stress and demand that you're putting on your body. So you're actually limiting the recovery or diminishing the recovery. So it's kind of a double whammy. You're, you're getting less benefits with increased injury risk if you run faster on your easy days. So, Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. So together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now, here's your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you so much for joining me today for episode 100 of the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. Last week, I talked to Hilary Dion, who shared her story of being the famous runner who held Meb's hand at the finish line. But also she talked about how she juggles 70 hour work weeks and her training as an elite runner. She is the balance right. And if you are struggling with that, her advice may help you. So today is a special episode. It is number 100. That means I have recorded almost 60 podcasts myself, and this is our podcast birthday. Well, if there is such a thing. For that reason, we're giving away 10 programs for the Run to the Top listeners. We have three to choose from, and they're worth between $29.99 and $59.99. And that's, so that's kettlebell, foam rolling, or stretching. So make sure you tune in to the end of the episode to see how you can be one of 10 winners. So hopefully by now you know that the Run to the Top podcast is a product of Runners Connect and not even just because I mentioned it at the beginning. We write helpful blog posts, actually give you the answers you need. We offer strength, nutrition, form, amongst many other courses. And the primary focus of Runners Connect is coaching and connecting those athletes in a community setting. So today you're going to hear more about the man behind Runners Connect, CEO Jeff Gordon. I had not heard most of what he talked about in this episode, especially about his life as an elite runner, and I think you're going to see a completely different side of Runners Connect. I feel even more passionate about the company after talking to Jeff, and I'm sure you will too. But before we begin, I would just like to quickly thank our sponsor. Running with music or podcasts distract us when those mental demons are loud but not when you're tangled in cords. Jabra Pulse is a wireless sports earbud that is perfect for runners of all levels and speed. Visit jabra.com forward slash runners connect to enter to win a free Jabra Pulse every month. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Jeff. Oh, thanks, Tina, for having me. I'm really excited. It's been a while, I think, since I've been on the podcast. So uh, good to be back. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of the listeners who are joining us right now may not have uh, listened to that those first few interviews you did, um, as it was a while ago. But for me, I was just saying to Jeff in the intro, uh, sorry, in the pre-talk before the interview, that we uh, I feel really nervous talking to him because it's just it's this this is very strange for me having to uh, interview you. So let's kind of for the people that don't really know too much about the the voice behind the name or the story behind the name can you like share a little bit about your history and who you are basically <laughs> yeah no that's great um so yeah i mean i guess i people call me the the oz behind runners connect um <laughs> it's uh it's been great the last few years as we've continued to grow the team uh tina obviously being one of those people um and uh, the people that, the team has been awesome so but um but yeah, a little bit about myself. Uh, I got into running really early in my life, probably like middle school, kind of going into high school. And uh, it really started to blossom when uh, I went out for the basketball team when I was a freshman. <laughs> and the basketball coach happened to also be the outdoor track coach. And he wanted me to run outdoor track, so cut me from the basketball team. Uh, or basically, I didn't make the tryout. So I was really <laughs> disappointed. All of my friends were playing basketball. And I was like, oh, man, I got to go run track. And so uh, the first meet, I decided to run the mile. I don't know why. That's That was the longest event that they had. I mean, I was obviously like, you know, thin and uh, just generally better at running longer. So I was like, well, I'll give this a try. And so I think I'm, I think I ran like 455 or something like that for the mile, yeah. which is very good. And, um, and I won the race. I mean, I'm from a small town in Maine, so it's not like winning the race is like a huge accomplishment, but, um, but I did win it. And I was like, from there on, I was hooked. Cause it was like, I mean, I thought I was like a superstar. I ran 455. <laughs> I won the race. I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. And so, yeah, from then on, I was just really hooked on running. And uh, as I got older, you know, my my interest in it involved, you know, more from, you know, obviously the winning side always stayed with me. But, um, you know, the passion for just being out and 
kind of being with myself and experiencing, I think probably what every runner's experienced that, that just that magical, uh, feeling that happens sometimes on a good run when, you know, I can vividly remember, you know, running in the mountains and just being awestruck by the beauty of Mm -hmm. things and, uh, you know, being stuck within yourself and how good it felt to have a great running day. So in any case, I, uh, continued to run through high school. I, uh, was lucky enough to do really well. And, uh, I ended up went, went on to run in college at Brown university and things went pretty well there. Uh, if anything, I learned a lot. I was kind of injured a lot. And most of it was because I was really too aggressive and, and kind of wanting to achieve things or, or train at a level that I just wasn't ready for yet. And, um, but, I, but in that process, I learned a lot about myself and a lot about training. And I did obviously have some success there. I was a couple time all American across country, uh, set the school record in the 5k. And that what was, was that, a, by the way, what? Oh, uh, 1407. Okay. Uh, that was indoors. So I, I luckily ran at a time for those that are listening that are into professional running. I luckily ran at a time where the U S wasn't quite as, uh, good as it is now in distance <laughs> running. So I, uh, my times don't really compare to these days, but, uh, definitely was decent back then. So, um, so yeah, after luckily, because I had success, uh, despite injuries and that kind of thing, I was able to kind of springboard into running professionally. So I moved to Michigan to run with the, uh, Hanson's Brooks Olympic development project. I ran that with them for two or three years. And, uh, that was a really uh, amazing opportunity. Um, obviously it was a great opportunity to, to train and to, uh, really test myself and see what I could do. Uh, but it was also, uh, a really great learning opportunity to learn from, you know, I trained with Brian Sell, who was a 2008 Olympian. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Desi, who was is now was a 2012 Olympian and, and hopefully will likely be a 2016 Olympian. Uh, and I learned from Kevin and Keith Hansen, who are very, very good at teaching the marathon. Um, so yeah, it was a great learning experience as well. And um, so I did that for two or three years, um, had moderate success. And then I decided to uh, try to pursue coaching. So I went into, uh, I I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina to kind of start uh, coaching in college. And also I started coaching online at that point. And that was, this was around 2007, 2008. And that's when the online portion of kind of coaching started for me as well as in person doing college coaching. And college coaching was great. I really enjoyed it, but uh, I had to move. And so uh, I, that's when I transitioned to doing full-time online coaching. And at that point I started, I was working with maybe 20 to 30 athletes wow. and, uh, it was a really great experience. I learned a lot about, um, you know, really how to communicate effectively online and how different athletes that I was working with, um, were so different because in the college atmosphere, you get some individual individuality, but with working online, you really work with a, such a huge variety of, mm-hmm. of athletes. So, you know, I was work. I would work with somebody who was, uh, you know, just trying to run the first 5K and and have never run before, and you know, had health issues, that kind of thing. Uh, and then on the flip side, at the same time, I'd be working with somebody who was trying to run sub three hours or qualify for Boston. And so it was a really, I love the challenge of you know every day thinking about how am I going to attack this person's uh, training plan so that we we they can have success given everything they have going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and likewise, the other really cool thing is that. Uh, at least I found it as, as a fun challenge is that, you know, in college, they're pretty much all doing the same thing. And they admittedly in college, you have a lot more free time. And, um, you know, now we're working with people who are, uh, you know, have really busy jobs working 60, 70 hours a week, have families, uh, wife and kids, uh, you know, all kinds of other things going on outside of running. And so it prevents, it prevents a unique opportunity to try to say, okay, well, we need to do X, Y, and Z, but we can't, you know, we don't have three or four hours in the day to do that. You know, how can we, how can we make that happen within your particular schedule? And so that was a really fun challenge that uh, I really enjoyed and started to take, um, I actually started to enjoy the online coaching more than I did kind of the in-person because of those unique challenges. And um, those, uh, I found it really fun to coach around that kind of stuff. Um, Yeah. So I'll, I'll keep going here. I know this is a long Oh, no, no. Question, this but... is interesting. I'm, I'm <laughs> learning this too. I didn't know this stuff. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so yeah, right around 2009, 2010, um, obviously I, I kind of started to reach a point where I wasn't able to take on any more athletes without sacrificing, uh, the amount of time that I was able to give to the athletes that I was currently coaching. So I actually started to bring on other coaches to kind of help, uh, take over some of our client load and to, you know, kind of expand the business a little bit. And that was really great. But uh, one thing that I really started to notice around this time was that uh, 
with myself and the other coaches that were on staff, um, you know, we started to notice that there was a lot of common questions and a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, interactions that were really difficult for a coach to communicate. So, uh, to give you an example, I, I know one year back in 2008, 2009, we had like 12 or 15 people training for the Boston marathon. Um, and I found it really interesting because I would be emailing all these people and I realized they all had a lot of the same questions, a lot of the same fears, a lot of the same emotions because they were all training for the same race, but none of them knew each other. Yeah. So it was, it was really funny. There was like this me, this common point, but, and I was like, oh man, you should really connect with Julie because, uh, you know, she's going through the same thing or, you know, she lives closer, you know, maybe obviously Boston, a lot of people train in the winter and it's like, man, she's dealing with the same issues with the snow as you are. And man, I really wish you guys could, could communicate with each other, you know, because it would really help like, you know, as a coach, you can say, okay, well, here's how we're going to adjust the workload. But, you know, there's a whole mental side of that. Oh, that, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's tough to do as I think tough to connect with as a coach, because, you know, your job is to kind of provide the workouts, provide that support. But having somebody else that's like going through it is a real, real big uh, motivating factor and something that can help a lot. So that's when the idea for Runners Connect came into mind. And the idea that we would be able to connect the runners that we're coaching uh, so that way they could use each other as in addition to the coaches to help them train better and to stay motivated and get through those rough patches. Um, so, yeah, that's when the idea kind of came into being. And over time, we've grown. We've added a couple coaches to our staff. Uh, but the premise of Runners Connect remains the same in that um, we really try to help connect uh, runners that are training under our coaches, uh, connect them with each other so they can share experiences uh, when they've done the same workout or they, you know, for example, one of the things that, um, a common question that we get within runners connect is, you know, about the fact that we don't necessarily believe that you'd need to do a 20 or 22 mile long run in marathon training, uh, to be successful. Um, and obviously that's a big, um, a big change for a lot of people who are used to doing 20, 22, 24 milers in their marathon training and to ask them to say, okay, well, your longest run is going to be 16 or 18 miles. Um, that's really tough to like grasp and to feel confident in. Uh, but the really cool thing is, uh, we see this a lot in, in the Runners Connect community is they'll post to the, to the forums. They'll say, you know, I, I, I'm really struggling with this 16 to 18 mile concept. Like, you know, I've done X, Y, and Z before and blah, blah, blah. And then immediately, you know, five to 10 people will jump on and be like, oh, I had the same issue mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. And, you know, you got to trust it. Like, this is what I did. And I set PRs. And so, that's one of those things like as a coach, I can keep telling somebody, yeah, it's going to work. It's going to work. And, you know, but I think somebody coming in and saying it's going to work because it did for me and here were the exact results. I think that makes a big difference in terms of feeling confident in the plan and that kind of thing. So that's, a, I think, a really good example of how uh, or the idea about Runners Connect and how that came about and being able to kind of facilitate the coaching and to uh, make it a little bit more connective and, and better overall. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the story. We're continuing to try to grow and, um, and to help more runners and to, uh, to keep a better and stronger and more, uh, interactive community going. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I've, I've definitely seen that myself. I mean, not, if, not, uh, just through you, uh, what you were saying, but that is a good example, but, um, it, I love to see when someone says, you know, I've, I've struggled with a workout today. I had a really hard time. And then, yeah, like you said, immediately 10 to 15 people will jump on and be like, hey, I did that workout a few weeks ago and I felt horrible, but, you know, this week I ran this time in, in this workout and I felt great and I know that workout helped me. And yeah, it really is great to see. And that's pretty, I've never even heard that story myself. So that was cool to hear how it like came about. And I'm sure it also helps with um, most of the, you know, our listeners out there who are, you know, recreational runners, like you said, they're parents, they've got busy jobs and running isn't the number one focus in their lives. But it, it's all very well, you know, you or I saying, you know, you'll be fine, you can do this. But then they're thinking, okay, but, you know, you're, you're like a lot of people think, oh, you're too fast. Of course, it's easy for you. But having one another to kind of um, bounce ideas off and say, I struggled too. And I got through this with people of a similar level, that's going to be that's going to be huge for a lot of people. So I think that's a really, really cool aspect of, uh, or the best thing about Runners Connect is that community sense. Um, so I just want to go back a little bit before we dive further into Runners Connect um, about a bit more about you. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners are kind of curious about um, your career as an elite. You said it was like a three-year 
two to three year um, career as a professional mm-hmm. runner at Hanson Brooks. Um, but you did mention that you had like a lot of injuries and are there any things that you can pinpoint now that maybe you did? Like, was it, you know, we, we hammer a lot with Runners Connect about the running easy on your recovery days. Was that an issue or what other things would you say contributed to your injuries looking back? Yeah, no, I mean, I made every mistake in the book. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think the two biggest ones are definitely, um, running my easy days too hard. That was a really big one for me and, um, not doing the right type of strength work, um, to set myself up for injury free training. Um, so for the, yeah, I mean, just like we harp upon with our articles and with our coaching about running your easy pace is easy. I mean, I just, you know, I felt like, and so I can totally relate to the athletes that come back to us and say how difficult it is to slow down because, I can completely relate because I had that mindset. I'm like, well, if I'm going out to run today, if I run, you know, if I run faster, then that is better for me. And I had a really hard time um, understanding that running faster on an easy day wasn't necessarily better. Um, For me, what really made it click was learning the science behind it. Um, And that's why we really try to preach the, the science and research behind why it's so critical to run your easy days easy. Um, at the time that just wasn't out there, or at least I didn't, wasn't aware of it. Um, but yeah, it was a huge issue for me because I just never was recovering. Um, you know, I would do a hard workout and then the next day I would, you know, try to push my easy day pace, even if I didn't feel good, you know, and that to me was a sign of being weak or that, um, that my fitness wasn't where I wanted it to be. If I, you know, if I went out and struggled on an easy day and ran a lot slower than I could have, or if I normally had, um, then I would immediately start thinking, oh, well, maybe I'm not as fit as I thought. Maybe, mm-hmm. um, uh, my, my training's not going well. Um, and really all, all that was, was my body saying, Hey, we're really tired. Um, we need to, you know, you need to run easier so that way we can recover better. Mm-hmm. And I just, I wasn't, you know, I didn't realize that's what was the, the process that was happening. Uh, and so it just definitely forced a lot of things that, uh, a lot of injuries that definitely sh- could have been taken care of a lot sooner. And when you say the science behind it, could you just explain that maybe briefly for people listening who may not have read it? Yeah, absolutely. So I think what's really important when you look at training is no matter what your training uh, goal is for the day is to to really ask yourself, what is the purpose of this specific workout? Whether it be a tempo run, an interval session, or even an easy day, every run has a specific purpose. And so when we look at easy days, there really are two main purposes. One is recovery and easy days can actually facilitate recovery if you do them easy enough because it it actually brings blood and nutrients and oxygen directly to the muscles that you're using while running since you're running um, and actually helps flush out a lot of, uh, delivers all those nutrients and that's how the muscles are actually able to recover or to grow back stronger. So they, they break down and then they use nutrients and oxygen to and blood to build back up. So if you're going easy enough, it's a great way to facilitate that. Um, So that's one way, that's one purpose of easy runs. And then the next purpose is to actually build the aerobic system. And if we look at the research, you know, the the aerobic system, there's, you know, we have a lot of different components of the aerobic system that we're trying to target, uh, mitochondrial development, uh, aerobic capacity, um, you know, those types of uh, scientific terms, capillary development, that kind of thing. And when we look at where those, where the optimal development of those are, um, you know, we see that it occurs anywhere from 55 to 70% of 5k pace. Um, and obviously that's a little tough scientifically or, uh, tough for, unless you're a math major to take like 55% of your 5k pace. But, mm-hmm. um, we do have some calculators available that, that do it for you, but, but basically that ends up being really slow. And so when we look at optimal aerobic development, that being a big purpose, then we want to make sure that our easy runs are within that target of optimal aerobic development. And most often, uh, you're not, when you run too fast, A, you're taking yourself out of that optimal aerobic development zone. Um, so you're kind of actually getting less bang for your buck than you would if you ran slower. And you're also increasing the stress and demand that you're putting on your body. So you're actually limiting the recovery or diminishing the recovery. So it's kind of a double whammy. You're, you're getting less benefits with increased injury risk if you run faster on your easy days. So I think if I think if that had been something that I knew earlier on in my career or really better understood, it would have uh, really helped. And so uh, hopefully explaining it now where people mm-hmm. that have read our articles c- can really connect with it and, and take it to heart. Yeah. And I will definitely put a link to the pace calculator on the show notes. But um, 
when it comes to people who think, okay, that sounds great, but how do I know if I'm running easy enough? Like, what are the biggest uh, indicators that you have found effective, either with the athletes you coach or yourself? Yeah, so for me, I think um, I think there's two ways. I think one would be pace, um, and pace really worked well for me and probably a lot of others um, because we, especially nowadays, back when I was running, we didn't have Garmin's and that kind of stuff, but. Uh, there was still a way to met, like I marked out mile markers on the road and just, I knew, you know, I'd time myself, but you know, nowadays with how technological running is, um, I think pace is a really great thing to focus on because a, we know from a pace perspective, what is optimal, uh, based on research. So it gives you a good barometer. And because of we're so technologically focused, I think it's just, it's just natural to say, okay, well, I always going to have my Garmin with me. It's always going to be tracking the X, Y, and Z. And so we'll go ahead and use that as, as a, the marker. Um, the other way I actually like to do it too is because I do think people need to take a break from the Garmin when it comes to improving their races um, and being more reliant, more on feeling and, and more on intu- intuition. Um, so I always say that, you know, you should be able to hold a full conversation while running. So easy should be easy. And I, I know that sounds a little um, funny to say, but I think when we think about easy days, we often don't comprehend the word why, why the word easy is in there. And it's in there because <laughs> yep. it should feel very easy. It should feel like really not working much at all. Um, and so I think from a, that standpoint, I say, you know, it really should feel like the point where you can go forever and it's really not hard. You're able to talk in full sentences. You know, like almost, we would almost be able to have this conversation uh, as is uh, if we were running easy, if, you know, once you get in good shape. So mm-hmm. that's kind of how I try to explain it to people. Yep, that's a good one. And one I've recently, I don't know if th- if this is true or anything, but... Um, since actually the interview with uh, Patrick a few weeks ago, I've actually been implementing the breathing techniques, he said, and uh, trying to breathe in and out of my nose on easy runs. And I find that mm-hmm. actually holds me back as well, because yeah. if you if you you can't <laughs> you right. can't run fast if you're uh, if you're trying to breathe in and out of your nose or at least I can't anyway so that's <laughs> another yeah, one that no, I that's find. a good way yeah <laughs> yeah okay um, and then just one more question about like your past. Um, at career as a as an elite as I'm sure people want to know a lot more but I have other things I kind of want to get to um mm-hmm. that I think but can you kind of describe for us maybe your favorite moment as an elite or your favorite race or just something that you went through that people will be like oh that was cool oh that's a good question um I think probably when I set my PR for 10k would probably be one of the better ones. I think any time I set a PR, I think that was <laughs> those were probably my biggest moments. You know, mainly because you know those are times that you know you work really hard towards, and they were times that I had in mind. Um, in the case of my 5K, a couple times, one was when I set the school record. That was obviously like a pivotal moment for me. The first time I broke 14 minutes for 5K, that was a big big deal. The first time I ran, I think the 10K, I ran 28:45. That would that qualified me for the U.S. Championships that year, so that was a big deal. Um, and I think the other one would be, I, I won the Ivy League championships uh, in 10K my junior, sophomore, junior year in college. And um, that was a lot of fun because it was a team event. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, when we won, ha- so we won the Ivy League cross country championships in 2003 and uh, as a team. And that was the first time we'd ever done that in school history. So that was like, a really awesome moment because it was more than just me. It was, you know, my entire team, something mm-hmm. as a team we'd worked so oh, hard. Oh, yeah, so, that's huge. Yeah, and those you- are definitely big moments for me. Do you find uh, a lot of the Runners Connect athletes are kind of in that way? Like they want to, they're not, you know, maybe a team in the traditional sense of the word, but want to like do well to kind of, um, you know, because they have supportive uh, other athletes that they've kind of supported along the way and they know have them and will have their back and kind of help them. Have you seen that as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the camaraderie on the site has been um, really amazing to Mm -hmm. me as watching it grow over the last few years. Um, it's been amazing. And, and now we're starting to do more in-person meetups, uh, at races yeah. and we camp uh, a yearly camp in the summer, late summer. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, that's been kind of an amazing process and to watch people on the site really get so in- involved with each other's training. And I mean, it's just, it's just amazing to watch, um, and to see that camaraderie. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. So then after you, uh, finished with, uh, you know, your professional running and you kind of moved on, you, well, we're going to kind of dive into this a bit more. And I know we talked before and you said it was okay to talk about, but you you actually yourself don't really run too much anymore. So could mm-hmm. you kind of explain why that is and um, what what your thinking was there? 
Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked. So I pretty much stopped running because I tore my plantar fascia. <clears throat> and so I needed about eight months off in order to let that fully heal. There were some complications in terms of getting back and stuff. And so uh, that was around 2009, 9-ish, 2010. And um, <clears throat> I started running again for a while after that. But um, I found that it was, I had a really hard time not I had a hard time like not training 100% or like training like an elite anymore since that would have been really my life for the last 10 years was kind of putting everything into my training. And so I had a really hard time staying motivated, just kind of running easy days. Like I'd still enjoy running and I still do. um, But I had a hard time saying like, you know, if it's a cold day or if they're just, I was busy or, you know, I found, I started finding a lot of excuses not to run because I just didn't have that, that drive to I wasn't really competing towards anything anymore. And then I also found that um, for me, I'm very goal-driven. And so I kind of know that, or yeah, I know that unless I put 110% into my training, it's very unlikely that I'm going to PR again, or I should say probably impossible at this point. But, um, you know, I'm never, you know, and that's such a big reason I think most people train is that they're, uh, they're looking to do something that they've never done before. Those are the types of goals that really motivate me. Um, and I know there's a lot of runners that are able to transition and say either, you know, not be able to run for a goal or to be able to shift their goal. So to say like, okay, well, I'm going to set my over 30 PR or my over 40 PR. Uh, but for me that I, that never really was a motivating for me for, for whatever reason, whether it's good or bad. Um, so I actually started looking at other ways that, um, really could motivate me. And so I'd always been really been into strength training, lifting, that kind of stuff, uh, back from when I was a kid, my dad was into weightlifting and my brother was a wrestler. And so, you know, weightlifting was always something that was big in my family. So I, I really started getting into that. And, um, it was funny. I was just reading just recently about Ryan Hall having mm-hmm. retired and he's just started to get into weightlifting too. And so for me, what, what it really was about was having that goal to be able to do and accomplish something that I'd never done before. And, you know, whether it be, you know, I remember the first time I benched 135, which is not a lot of weight <laughs> for those who know or do not know weightlifting. Um, but for me, it was, I'm like, wow, I did it. That's really cool. And uh, even now, you know, that's what I continue to do. And so there are things that I'm doing in the gym that maybe I've never done before that I, I'm really challenging myself. And that's what, mo- like, that's what motivates me to, to get in and do it every day. It excites me. It's the stuff that I am, you know, personally thinking like, you know, thinking about at night, like, oh, wow, I got to, I got to go squat tomorrow and I hope it goes well. And, you know, that, the same feelings that I had about running are the same things that I do in the gym. So yeah, that's basically why I don't run much. And so how that connects to not running much anymore is that uh, naturally I'm a very thin person. You know, that's just my, my makeup, luckily. Uh, but in order to lift lots of weight, you need to gain lots of weight. And so not that I'm big by any means, but uh, in order to continue my progress in lifting, uh, I have to not run because I will end up just losing weight like yeah. really quickly. So I know that's a problem most people want to have, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so that's, that's kind of why I don't run quite as much anymore is cause I just, it doesn't mix well with what I'm trying to do in the gym. Yeah, no, that's, that's great to hear. And, um, do you want to tell the listeners about the thousand pound challenge? Oh, that yeah, you're, sure. You're shooting um, for? So <laughs> yeah, so I, my goal, my current goal is to do what's called the thousand pound challenge, which is to deadlift, squat and bench a thousand pounds uh, in one day. So like basically you go to the gym at once and you uh, roughly it comes out to squatting 325, deadlifting 420-ish and benching Oof. 250. I mean, you can do any of those in any, comp- like you can add or lower any of those, but those are the rough averages that I'm kind of looking at. Mm-hmm. So that's really interesting. That's crazy. I can't. I can't even wrap my head around lifting that. <laughs> yeah, you know what's funny is I now that I've started to do this. I mean, yeah, I, I would say a couple of years ago I'd have been like, no, no, absolute way I could do that. <laughs> but now I look at guys like when I watch track on television and stuff, and I see them running times, and I'm like, there's no way that like I, I look at how fast it is, and it's just, it's uncomprehensible. Yeah, and yeah, it's really it. weird because then I'm like, oh well, you actually used to be able to do that, and <laughs> it seems so far away. It's, it's odd. I could see that. So okay, this is something that kind of is I've been thinking about as as you've mentioned this in the past, and then today, and I'm sure other people have. But how how do you think you've managed to keep it to where you kind of lost the you weren't fully invested and you lost the like passion, I guess, for running yourself? Kind of like a, like you said, Ryan Hall and Matt Tegenkamp as well. Um, both kind of said the same thing. 
Um, but how have you managed to keep your passion for the sport and itself? Like, I feel like most people would be like, okay, I'm done with running. I don't want anything to do with running. So how it's like amazing to me that you're still, um, you know, interested in other people's running. Yeah, no, that's actually a great question. Um, you know, I think for me, it's, um, it was never a loss of interest in running. Uh, it was more the interest in, or the idea that I needed a goal uh, I'm very goal driven. And mm-hmm. so the, for me, the goal had to shift from running to something else, uh, in order for me to feel satisfied athletically, but the passion for running didn't really change. I mean, I, I definitely still have a, like, I, I, you know, I often think like, I'll, obviously most of my friends on Facebook and stuff are, are runners or are still running. And I see pictures of them at beautiful locations or in races. And I definitely think, you know, like, oh man, I, I remember, that looks like an amazing place to run, you know, like that's just awesome. And I, and I really feel connect to that feeling that I think all runners know of when you're just in that zone and you're either in a, a, a an amazing spot or you're just having a good workout or whatever it is, it's really connecting you to yourself, maybe a more spiritual self. You know, I, I can still, I can still relate to that. And I still, I still like that. Um, and I think the other big thing is for me, I was always, and still am very passionate about the research and science behind running. And so, so that hasn't really gone anywhere. If anything, I would say that going into another sport has really helped broaden my horizon. So instead of just looking at, okay, well, just being completely focused on running, looking at how other sports do things, mm-hmm. um, I've learned a lot about nutrition, recovery, supplements, that kind of stuff by going into the, not that I'm bodybuilding, but the bodybuilding world. And so I think, uh, so to me, it's been a, a, a nice, ch- a, a new challenge to be able to connect what I'm doing now with running and how that relates and to broaden that spectrum of uh, exercise physiology knowledge uh, and, and bring it back to running. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then finally, I think, you know, I, I love to coach. I mean, that's a, a huge passion of mine. I, I do enjoy helping athletes achieve goals. And it's not even so much helping athletes run fast. Uh, to me, it's about helping athletes do something that they never thought possible. That to me is the real joy in coaching is when somebody signs up and, you know, doesn't think they can do something or has no, you know, like says, oh, I want to run 325 in the marathon. And then, you know, I know in the back of my mind, they could probably run 315 or 310. Um, You know, that to me is what's really cool when they, Mm -hmm. when they eventually run 310 for them to just be like, wow, I just never thought this was something possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, that's, so, so there's, that's still a big passion for me. Yeah, no, that's great. And I mean, that right there just kind of shows, you know, how uh, well, great of a person you are and how just thoughtful you are to, you know, invest. That brings you so much joy to see other people. And actually, I can kind of selfishly say I was kind of almost the other way. I did two years of uh, coaching after college um, and I kind of realized that it was a similar thing. Like it was too much running. Like I I liked ha- I like having running as my hobby, but I didn't want it as like co- coaching. Running was just too much running, mm-hmm. so it's funny seeing you're you're on kind of the other side of the fence. But you're obviously on the selfless side, and I'm on the selfish side. Oh but... no, no, I mean I think it's I think it's more a realization about what motivates and drives yeah. you and, yeah. and what makes you happy. You know? Yeah, and I love that you followed you know your heart. You followed what. Um, what your your gut was telling you, which, you know, more and more we learn that um, our gut feeling is often actually, you know, right in so many ways, but you, you knew that to, um, to follow your heart and trust that, yeah, maybe your time for running was up, but you could still help others with theirs. And was there ever a point, like, was it difficult for you to realize that? Was there a point, did you keep trying to like come back and keep trying to run thinking, oh, you know, you didn't know a life without it? Yeah, no, that was definitely hard. And I think almost every athlete goes through that. I mean, you know, luckily for me, part of it was injury related and Mm -hmm. that I had to take eight to 10 months off. So that was a really, I think I would have had a really hard time stopping had there not been an injury. I think I always would have kept going with it. Uh, But it made it a lot easier in that there was an injury. So it gave me a long period of time to feel like what life was like without running. Like Um, break the habit, essentially. Yeah, exactly. And then also you know, one of the things that I think keeps people coming back is that if you are good at it, it's easy to get fairly good again. So like, you know, I could have kept going on and and being pretty good, but once that injury happened, like it was going to take a lot of work to get back to being pretty good. So that helped, I think, give it a break as well, but it was still hard. I I would still have weird, odd nightmares that uh, I would be back in college and I, I would show up for, um, fall 
like the fall semester and, and I ha- wouldn't have run because I hadn't, you know, I, was, I wasn't running at the time. Mm-hmm. And I would just remember thinking like, oh my God, I've let my team down. I've let myself down. I'm not going to achieve my goals. And that was, that was a recurring nightmare. And so it was very weird. But, uh, you know, so I was always like scared that, I, I don't know, that I was going to want it back and, and not um, be able to. Mm-hmm. So that was that was definitely the harder part, I think. Yeah. And did, did you kind of go through like an identity crisis during that time or was it just kind of as soon as that injury happened, you obviously went through some kind of like depression when it first happened, but then you kind of started moving on? Yeah, I think um, I think at the time I was super busy. Um, I was starting the business. I was working full time and I was in grad school. And so um, I think that kind of kept really me distracted. Helped. Yeah, I think that helped keep me distracted from kind of the changes that were happening. It was just everything was so busy. And then as things, you know, things started to gradually calm down. And at that point, I was a lot more comfortable with where Mm -hmm. things were at uh, Mm -hmm. from a personal perspective. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And we, okay, so then moving on to uh, to Runners Connect and, you know, starting the business and everything, you've talked about, you know, how the vision came up and how it kind of began. But when it comes to the other side of things, beyond the coaching, we have this podcast here, we have the blog, and you have uh, all the programs, you know, the nutrition, the form, uh, kettlebell strength, all of those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Um, But you really like to focus on, like you said earlier, the science, the, you know, the real deal and not really the fluff. But how did that kind of come along? How did that go along with the coaching aspect that you wanted to have the the real information as opposed to all the the junk we read out there, you know, on BuzzFeed and things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's a great question. So I think it came down to a couple things. Um, I think the biggest one for me is that um, I looked at what really, like I kind of looked at it from a self perspective, like what really helped me grow as an athlete and to be able to better understand my training. And I always felt that I trained better and had more success when I really understood the why and the process of what I was doing. And so, I, you know, whether, you know, obviously it worked out, but, you know, my thought process was I want to be able to translate that to the athletes that I coach. So I want to give them the, the science and the reason and the process for everything that they're doing. So it's not just, well, here's some schedule. I have no idea why it is that I'm doing this. Mm-hmm. They can really have the, here's exactly why you're doing this. And so, uh, that was really helpful for me, and I wanted to be able to translate that to to the athletes I coach. So that's why we had a really strong focus initially on, you know, the science and the research behind things. I also found that it really helped. Um, you know, I think I think sometimes when we look at, um, you know, if we want to use the word fluff, like articles that just really have no, like I'm very into, I'm very concerned with the information that we put out being as accurate as possible or as helpful as possible. And I know, you know, there are definitely different ways to approach training and I'm very open to different training methods and taking into different uh, accounts of how things work. Um, but I think, you know, I, I want to be very careful when I, uh, you know, it's, it's a very self-conscious thing that says, you know, if I, if I recommend something, I want to be very confident that it works. And I, I don't want to just recommend something for the sake of it being easy. And so, and so I, that's why I looked at the research side of things and to make sure that, okay, even though we're recommending this, we're not just going to take the easy way out and say, oh yeah, you can run a marathon on 15 miles a week, you know, and here's a plan how to do it because I don't, I personally don't think that that works. And so I wanted to make sure that everything we did was, I, I am confident that this is going to work. And I think that really helped formulate the process of the foundation for everything that we did was being confident that it was going to work in some way. Mm-hmm. No, and I think that's that's definitely become evident in a lot of the the programs, and particularly in particular the strength, the form, and the nutritional blueprint that you really have put the time and the effort into, you know, creating them and making them the absolute best you can be. And they are high quality. And um, you know, it, it's funny um, you didn't know this, but um, <laughs> I was thinking earlier about how um, when when Jeff first hired me he kind of said that he wanted to make sure all of the blog posts like had really were good really epic was the word you used and making sure that they really had everything in them and at the time I was like you know why do they need to be that long but it was only when I kind of realized that um, so many articles you you know you google something and it comes up and you click on it and you like scroll your way down really quick and it doesn't really tell you much and so you go back and then you go to the next one but with those Runners Connect articles, I mean, a lot of them were done way before I was, I came along. Um, 
and they they do have everything you need they have you know what are the symptoms what is the treatment uh, what is a you often have like uh, conservative and aggressive treatments and it really does have everything you need so I really I've kind of understood that now and I think a lot of people are starting to realize how Runners Connect actually is like you say it gives you everything you actually need rather than um, just giving you you know like you said the 15 mile thing it's like okay if you're going to do this this is how you're going to do it and it's a long post explaining how so I've really even come to see that myself and I think more and more people are starting to um so thanks <laughs> no you're welcome uh, so then with Runners Connect we kind of talked a bit about the community um aspect and uh you know the science behind it but what other things make Runners Connect different to other online coaching programs yeah, so I think, you know, the, the real focus that I had when we were first developing the platform was, um, you know, I think it's important to to realize that not all athletes are, you know, there's so many variety of athletes. So I think one of the problems that I always saw was that, you know, you'd say, okay, well, I want to run a marathon, so I'm going to pick up this beginner training schedule. Well, what's a beginner? You know, like, how do we define that? Um, what if, you know, I can classify a beginner as running 15 miles a week and one running 30 miles a week. Um, those are probably both beginner runners, but, uh, they could be coming at training from completely different backgrounds. Uh, one could be overweight, have a lot of injuries or injury history, uh, maybe not be healthy overall. Um, the other could be, well, they're doing 30 miles a week, but, uh, they are, you know, they do CrossFit or they're doing a lot of other cross training activity. They're extremely fit. Um, you know, the way you're going to approach the, the training plan for both of those is going to be very different. And so uh, that was really the, the idea behind the platform was that we need to take more into account just, uh, you know, when you go online, you see like, oh, well, pick a beginner marathon plan and then that's what you pick or pick a marathon based on your mileage uh, because there's just so much more to a training plan than, you know, those two factors. Um, and then you started to get into... Um, you know, from an online coach perspective, I really learned that there, one, like I said, one of the challenges was that not everybody has the same schedule. So for some people, work running long or running both weekend days is really ideal because that's when they have the most time. For others, it's, you know, during the week, they're fairly free, but the weekends, it's family time and they don't have any time to train. And so you can't just take a training plan and say, okay, well, these are going to be your runs and you know, make it work around your schedule. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I really wanted to create something that we could work around somebody else's schedule because that is going to lead to more success, both in terms of um, staying on that plan, being happier with the plan. And I think if you're happy with the plan, being more successful, and I think it's going to allow you to stay in the sport longer because it's not, you know, it doesn't become this, okay, well, I'm training for a marathon that's 16 weeks of hell. <laughs> it's, I'm training for a marathon. This is 16 weeks of progression that I can handle. And that is fun because it's a new challenge every week or down the road. Um, so yeah, that was another, another big part of it. Um, and then finally, the, the, the other big key piece to it was there's never been a training segment that I've been in where things went 100% according to, according to plan. So something always comes up, whether it be uh, an injury or a missed day, a missed week, uh, you got sick, work was crazy. I mean, something always happens. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I wanted to be able to create with the Runners Connect platform was the ability to adjust training. And so it's not just, okay, well, you have your training plan, now you're good to go, you know, or kind of like, uh, like I'd seen before, it's kind of like, you know, like you, somebody writes your training plan, and then it's kind of like you're on your own to, to make it work based on things that come up, or to make it work um, in the sense of kind of keeping you motivated and keeping you accountable. Uh, and so that's where, the other big component of Runners Connect came in where we wanted to be able to provide some sort of um, coaching or uh, expert advice in that. That way you can adjust because no matter what, no matter who you are, something's going to happen. Uh, and to be able to adjust it the correct way, because I see, uh, and this isn't necessarily the fault of athletes, but you know, when you're an athlete and you don't know much about exercise physiology or training or kind of how things work, you can definitely mess up a training schedule pretty easily. Uh, and I've seen it happen. And it's one of those things that's tough because as a coach, you look at it and you're like, that's mm -hmm. like, I look at it with my years and years of coaching experience. I'm like, that is probably the stupidest thing you could have done. But I can put myself in the, uh, the mind of the athlete because if they don't know any better, why would they know that you're not supposed to do a workout and then a long run the next day? You know, like, you know, to me, that seems like such common sense, but mm -hmm. to them, it may not, it's something that may not be apparent. 
mm-hmm. or you know, talking about easy pace, it may not be apparent. It's definitely not apparent to most people why running an easy day is as beneficial, if not more beneficial than running faster. And so those are the types of things that I think with the Runners Connect platform, we've tried to help help curve a little bit. Yeah, and I've definitely seen that a lot through um, people, you know, who have been using uh, the platform to who have said, you know, that they they used to make all these mistakes or they, you know, like you said, just naivety, just didn't know about it. And, um, you know, it is good to see that the outside perspective actually helps you. And I think you're right that something is always going to go wrong. Um, and it's often the case that um, because we have this, you know, we want to do our best and we want to prove we're as committed as we always intended to be, that often we'll go the aggressive route and, like you said, do a workout and then a long run try because we can't possibly miss that long run, whereas mm-hmm. actually it probably would be better for you to just skip it. Um, but we don't want to, like, wimp out or back out or something. So, yeah, I think that having that, that voice there to kind of uh, be the voice of reason and, you know, change things for you, I think, mm-hmm. I think that is huge and um, uh, it's definitely a strength that Runners Connect has. Um, so just for those who may not have even, you know, been aware of, um, the coaching program before, or could you could kind of explain maybe the levels or what's available? So if someone is kind of sitting on the fence about thinking about hiring a running coach, like what they would actually get if they did, uh, join the program. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, we really have two levels of coaching. Uh, we have what's called our runners connect membership, which is, um, $49 a month, or we do have a discount, um, if you pay annually. Uh, but basically, uh, what that provides is we write you a training schedule that's customized to you based on kind of all the things that we talked about, but you know, mileage experience level running days, whether you want strength training, what your goal race is, when your goal race is. So it can really be any length, uh, of time. Uh, and we, basically incorporate the idea of working on your strengths and weaknesses during the training process if we have enough time. And then basically from there, we provide coaching support via via what we call our activity stream, which is uh, when you log your workouts, you're able to post them to the stream and our coaches and the community will comment on them. So that's how athletes get the feedback from other athletes as well as coaches. And so uh, the really cool part of it is that um, you're actually getting access to our team of coaches. So you don't really, ha- with our Runners Connect plan, you don't really have access to, you're not working one-on-one with one particular coach. You're actually working with all of our coaches. And so the really cool part about that is, A, you get a really, and, and we all follow kind of what happens every day. So you get a really great um, balance of different coaches that can provide different insight into your training. Uh, but it also gives really pretty quick answers since for the most part, we're in this, uh, coaches are monitoring the stream almost 24-7. So it provides a really great um platform for whether you live in, you know, East, if you're in Eastern United States, if you're in the Canada, if you're in the UK, if you're in Australia, we have athletes all over the world. Um, and the really cool part about it is to be able to provide that coaching, um, pretty much all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's our Runners Connect membership. And then we have, we do still have personal coaching where, uh, you will work one-on-one with just one coach. And for some people that is a little bit better that they prefer that option because they just want to work one-on-one with somebody or, they need, you know, they, they just, um, they tend to want to have that one-on-one interaction every day with the same type of person. So, and that's, uh, the personal coaching is $169 a month. Okay, great. Thank you for explaining that. And I think that's very helpful. Um, so then where do you see Runners Connect going in the future? Do you have any, do you want to share any insights of what you'd like it to become or where you'd like it to go? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So I think from a brand, uh, if we look at Runners Connect itself with all of our products and that kind of thing, uh, the thing that we're looking at now is trying to move to a more unified experience. So it's a little disjointed now because you you can sign up for a strength program and that's kind of separate from the training program and kind of separate from nutrition and that kind of thing. And so uh, we want to unify everything under kind of one big umbrella. So when you purchase a product, it gives you know it's, it's easier to access. Uh, it, you're kind of staying within the Runners Connect umbrella. Uh, and we're also starting to push uh, higher quality content in the terms, of, in the sense of uh, webinars, um, seminars, video courses, that kind of stuff. So really starting to up the up the level of uh, quality and insight that we're able to provide from the content standpoint. Uh, from the training plan perspective and the training platform, um, we're actually, you know, I think for us, the the growth is going to come more from being able to develop the platform into mm-hmm. a more robust. Um, 
community and robust uh, platform. So for example, in just this spring, we started launching, we launched a new platform for the logging of the workouts where uh, we have more imports. So you can import from Garmin, you can import from RunKeeper, um, iSmooth Run. <clears throat> um, you can log multiple workouts in a day. So if you run twice a day or if you do strength workout in the morning and then uh, run at night, you can log them both, um, logging all your cross training, that kind of stuff. So um, short end of the story is, you know, adding more feature, uh, functionality and features that allow people to better connect and create uh, tighter knit groups with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, creating a group, if you're training for Boston 2016, uh, you know, connecting, I think right now we have 25 or 30 athletes that are training for uh, Boston 2016. So they're connecting in a, in a, obviously with the entire runners connect community, but with a tighter community amongst themselves, which is really, yeah, really great. paying off because it's, it's uh, like, you know, we talked about at the beginning. Uh, it's really creating that real sense of motivation and community that, Hey, we're all in this together, you know, whether it's snowstorms and, or hot weather or whatever it may be kind of all going towards the same goal. And that's going really well. So that's kind of the future. Yeah, no, it sounds good. And uh, I look forward to being a part of it. So Jeff, before we begin our final kick round, I just want to pause for a second just to thank our sponsor. Some days we need all the motivation we can get to make sure we finish our workout or make it through that cross training session, especially when we're trapped indoors. It has been well documented that running with music or a motivating podcast can help improve performance. But as much as I love the idea, I found myself getting frustrated with the cords getting in my way or when they would rip out of the treadmill. Finally, I have a solution. Jabra Pulse is the sweatproof, weatherproof, wireless sports earbud that is perfect for runners of all levels and speeds. Even better, it has an accurate in-ear heart rate monitor that quickly connects to your phone so you can ditch the chest strap. The earbuds will have a secure and comfortable fit thanks to the ability to customize the earpieces. Runners Connect listeners can get exclusive offers and enter to win a free Jabra Pulse headset by signing up at jabra.com forward slash runners connect. That's J-A-B-R-A dot com forward slash runners connect to start your journey or buy the Jabra Pulse at your local Best Buy. Jabra, this is where it starts. So I just have a few more questions for you in the final kick round, which uh, are right. just based on your personal... So you decided on a name, it's the final I did. kick. final kick. And actually, All yeah, right. um, I think maybe seven or eight people suggested that. So I was quite impressed that that I many like people like came up with the there. same same thing. Yeah. So uh, what is the greatest advice you've ever received? Oh, um, when it comes to running, I think the greatest advice I've, I've ever received is um, don't be afraid, uh, to take a rest day. Um, mm. whether that be because you're tired or, um, because you're injured. I know for me, I would have saved myself so much agony if I just like, Oh, I'm starting to feel like my Achilles. Like I'll just take one or two days mm -hmm. off and, you know, baby it and take care of it and do what it needs to be get done. You know, I would have, it would have saved, you know, taking two or three weeks off down the road and then a more in, inopportune time. Um, so yeah, that's definitely the best advice I've ever seen is, is don't be afraid to take a rest day, uh, when your body's telling it, telling you that it needs it. So just along those lines, uh, I know this is supposed to be quick, but I know this is something that people definitely struggle with. And I know I, I've only just got to the point where I can do it, but any advice for how people actually listen to that voice that says, you know, something's not quite right. Yeah, no, that's, that, that is, becomes a tough part because then you start questioning like, okay, well, am I being weak mm -hmm. or is this something that is really happening here? Um, so I think part of it is develop, you know, you develop that over experience. So like you mentioned intuition, um, over time, the longer you run, the more, the more you'll start to recognize certain signs and symptoms of things that have happened in the past or recurring. Um, but, uh, to be honest, I think that's where having, uh, somebody that you can talk to about mm -hmm. it makes sense. Yep. Um, whether it be a coach or be another uh, somebody from the outside, um, coach is the best. But um, even if it's just a running buddy, um, that can make a tremendous difference because having that outside perspective um, can really help you kind of understand things. So I think sometimes we think like to give you an example where it's tough to distinguish like, OK, am I just being weak or am I uh, am I really tired here? I think sometimes we can kind of forget like what we've done in the past. So like, I'm trying to think like a, a good example would be like, let's say you looked at your training and, and you had run a race and then a long run close by and another really hard workout. And then you start to get tired. You could start to think like, oh, well, maybe I'm just being weak. But then your running friend would say, look, you ran this mm -hmm. race, uh, you ran this, uh, this long run and then this many miles. That means 
um, let's, I'm just putting a number of like, uh, 16 of your last 30 miles, the last five days have been, uh, at high quality or at marathon pace or faster, whatever that number, the, whatever that value is, um, that can, that's one of those things like you might not recognize yeah. yourself, but when somebody says it to you, you're like, Oh wow, you're right. That like makes yeah, a lot of sense. Definitely. Um, and that can help kind of help you determine whether or not it's just kind of like, oh, I'm being weak or yeah, I'm really, I really need something mm-hmm. here. Great advice. Thank you. Uh, favorite running book or blog. And as much as I'd love to say it, you cannot say runners connect. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's actually pretty easy. My favorite running book uh, is definitely once a runner okay. uh, by John L. Parker. Good. Um, Good one. Yeah. It's uh, I, yeah. For me, that was one of those things that like, uh, when I, so I obviously grew up in a time when the internet wasn't like really huge. So like when I was in high school, I think we probably just started getting the internet. And, um, when I first read that book, it was like uh, amazing to me because I realized that other people like had the same like passion mm-hmm. and joy of running. And, and it was the first time I'd ever seen it expressed in any way, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why that book's so meaningful f- for me because there just wasn't the internet to see that there was like, <laughs> not just that one or two people, but literally hundreds of thousands of people that understood running the way I did. But, um, so that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. I'm interested for this one. What advice, what would you like to tell a new runner? Oh yeah. Um, that's a good question. I think there's a lot. I mean, I think, uh, you know, going back to the easy pace argument, you know, the easy pace discussion we were having, I think would be important. Um, but to give something new and fresh, um, I think I would tell them to, um, to not, to not get caught up in monitoring training, um, on a weekly or daily basis. Okay. Um, because I think what happens is initially when somebody starts running, uh, they start making, you, you kind of start making gains pretty quick. Um, you know, you go pretty quickly from, well, man, I'm barely able to run to like, I can run a couple miles to, I can run a couple miles faster mm-hmm. and, and the, the gains start coming really quick. And that's a lot of fun. Uh, but at some point, uh, training is going to start getting difficult, um, or it's going to be difficult to continually see progress. Like I, I think, you know, you would obviously know this, like when was the last time you went on a training run or a workout where you felt like you PR, you know, like longest <laughs> run ever, or, uh, you know, I think so many of the, the running apps and stuff focus on like, Oh, you've achieved your long- longest run ever. And that's like cool for somebody that's new, but eventually that's going to go away yeah. because yeah. it's going to get harder and harder to reach those goals. So I think, uh, being able to, understand that it's a long-term process and that to not get so caught up in that. And I'd like to tell the story of, uh, Milo of, uh, I forget the place that begins with a C. Um, I should know this cause I'm an ancient history major, but basically the story of Milo who, when he was a child, put a calf on his back and carried a calf around every day. It's a myth, <laughs> but, uh, and every day carried the same calf. And so as the calf grew, he grew. Uh, and by the time he was an adult, he was carrying a full, uh, a full, uh, grown cow on his back. Um, and so if, if somebody were to look, if a beginner were to look at what it takes to run a marathon, they would say like, there's no way I can do that. There's no way I can run 22 miles, 26 miles, or do that particular workout. Uh, but it's not, you know, there's a process to getting there and mm-hmm. you need to make sure that you, um, focus that there's going to be a process and it doesn't just happen overnight. Yeah. I love that analogy. That's really cool. That's, that's a good one. Um, okay. Favorite, well, pa- past, I guess, pre-race meal. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was always pasta. So I definitely grew up in that. That's uh, the night before or the morning of? Oh, the morning of? Either um, of. Yeah. So morning of, it definitely started, you know, went probably to like bagels and peanut butter. Mm-hmm. I think I need to change this question actually, because you're probably the third person who has, uh, when I've said pre-race meal, has thought dinner. So maybe it's just the wording <laughs> from England to America, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm obviously confusing people with that one, but that's, no, that's good. Okay. Thanks for sharing. And finally, your favorite running product. Hmm. That's a good question. Okay. I've, I, uh, yeah, I think most running products are pretty, pretty cool. Um, there's so many things that do, do like really cool things. Um, like just caught, off the top of my head, I'm thinking, so I don't have like really one. I think for me, like Garmin was revolutionary. I stopped running right about the time Garmin really started getting good. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause like they made a watch like a lot, like probably starting back in like 2006, 2007. Uh, but it was like huge. Mm-hmm. It li- literally took up like your yeah, entire wrist. Uh, <laughs> and it wasn't very accurate. Like it would like, even if there was like one tree, it was like, Oh, there's a tree. I have lost signal. Yeah. Um, so nowadays, those are really cool. Like, I mean, I think that would have been a game changer. Well, really cool to, to train with. Um, I loved Yak Tracks. I thought that mm-hmm. was such an in, in, 
ingenuitive thing. Uh, for people that don't know, yak tracks are like um, this thing that you this thing that you slide on your shoes so that way you can get better grip in ice and snow. Um, I always thought that was especially was being cool. in Michigan. You, you need yeah, those. Michigan. I grew up in Maine, and <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, okay. absolutely, those are critical. <laughs> yep, yep. I got to know those very well too in college. Okay, Jeff. Well, um, that's about all I have for now. But um, I mentioned it a little bit in the intro. But um, Jeff has actually said that uh, because this is our one hundredth podcast, um, we're actually going to be giving away uh, ten of our products um, to any. Uh, listeners so I will be talking about that um, a little bit in the well I guess the outro the part after the podcast so stay tuned for that but you're going to have a choice between uh, the kettlebell the stretching and the foam rolling program which uh, was it between 29.99 and 59 you said the values yeah those are the the price range of those products okay so stay tuned and you can find out how you can be one of 10 people to win that but uh, Jeff, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And as this has been great for me to learn more about uh, your background and I'm sure um, our audience are also enjoying it. So thank you. Awesome. I had a lot of fun. Thank you, Tina. You did great. And that's a wrap. I can't believe that 100 episodes have been done already. But I think I've come a long way since episode 41 with Dave McGillivray. Now, I don't want you to go listen to that, but you might want to enjoy it just for a comical value. (laughs) So as I mentioned, for our 100th podcast birthday, we're giving away 10 kettlebell stretching or foam rolling programs worth $29.99 to $59.99. And you have the choice. And you can enter to win by going to runnersconnect.net forward slash rc100. And that's also where you can find all the links to everything Jeff and I talked about today. So I really enjoyed hearing the story behind Runners Connect, and it just goes to show how much Jeff loves seeing people reach their goals, which was pretty cool for me to hear and hopefully for you too. If you did enjoy, for a 100th birthday present to me, if I may be so cheeky to ask, would you mind leaving a review about the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher, whichever one you use to listen? I give you all the instructions you need, along with all the other podcast-related information on our podcast page, which you can access through the show notes I just mentioned. Next week, we're going to be talking to Stephanie Howe, who's the ultra runner with an extensive knowledge in nutrition. She has some recommendations for us that shocked me when it comes to fueling for races. You are not going to want to miss this one. So until next time, have a great week.